completed a PhD at the University of California, Los Angeles. He, he taught at Victoria University of Wellington for 20 years, becoming co-director of the Center for Applied Cross-Cultural Research. And James Liu is now professor of psychology at Massey University in New Zealand. James is currently uh, co-editor in chief of the Journal of Political Psychology. Pre previously was president of the Asian Association of Social Psychology, editor in chief of the Asian Journal of Social Psychology. He now serves as senior editor, and uh, he has been head of School of Psychology at Massey University. And he has a long-term vision of psychology as an applied research practice with strong community service and teaching roots. His areas of expertise, in these areas, he is a well-known social and cultural and political psychologist. His areas of expertise are on social representations, cross-cultural psychology, indigenous psychology, globalization, prejudice and intergroup relations, digital influence, it means how mass media consumption influences attitudes, values, political ideology, and behavior, and vice versa. James has more than 200 reference read publications that have been cited more than 10,000 times. Among his most cited papers are social representations of history and their role on identity politics, co-author with Dennis Hilton, and Distance Matters, Physical Space and Social Impact, co-author with B. Latane and Angenova. He is also known for several papers using large cross-cultural data sets from different countries, published mainly in the Journal of Cross-Cultural Psychology, particularly, particularly social representations of events and people in world history across 12 cultures. Uh, James, um, it is an honor for us having you here today in this room. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to stay exactly within um, one hour. Uh, thank you, Mikhail um, and Anna and people in Shesh for inviting me. Um, I think the morning is very appropriate because we're going to try to set the background for the more specific studies that are going to be presented in the afternoon. So I know very little about the Portuguese housing crisis, but while each national context is unique, it also has certain global origins. So I'm going to talk about these deeper structural factors from my perspective as a social, political, and cross-cultural psychologist. And of course, I'm going to begin in the Anglo-European sphere, and I'll move into the Asian sphere, as Joaquim uh, alluded to. I think uh, we need to consider where the new solutions are coming from in the 21st century. So I'll begin with the, the big picture. And it's actually a big picture is almost like an unconscious representation in the minds of people. And that is this idea of neoliberal economics. If you ask people what is neoliberalism, they don't really know what it is. But it affects everyone's life in every country in the world, whether you're aware of it or not. It's especially salient in the Anglo-speaking countries. I've lived in New Zealand for um, uh, almost 30 years now. So it's the dominant economic paradigm for managing national economics around the world. Um, and the consequences of this being the dominant paradigm for almost 40 years now is increasing income inequality within a country, but also more income equality between nations. So um, that's the thing that the Europeans and the Americans forget, is actually the world is by numbers. If you count every person one equal, which most people don't, it's actually more equal now than it was then. And the reason is the capital and income has flowed out of Europe and the United States towards the more successful majority world countries like China and India. So those incomes are much higher. There's a huge middle class in those countries now. There wasn't 40 years ago. So that's the big picture. But this is the dominant paradigm to describe it. Within this dominant paradigm, there are tremendous variations in policy, 
and historical trajectory that tell a complex story about whether housing is affordable in any given country. Because I'm a cross-cultural theorist and a representational theorist, I'm going to give you the big picture, but also realize that big picture is not accurate for any one country. So I'm going to use some initial big cross-cultural data um, and then case studies of specific countries, because you can't overgeneralize. Neoliberalism is all about overgeneralization. One size fits all. It does not. If you follow that, you're a fool, and you're going to go down. Uh, this is just the way it is. And let me show. So New Zealand is a country where we worship neoliberalism without even being aware of it, because we're a small country in the Anglosphere. Loyal servants of the British Empire. Our head of state is King Charles. Okay. And the simple story is that neoliberalism is making the world safe for billionaires. Okay, everyone knows which country in the world has most billionaires. Who has most billionaires? USA. USA. Okay, who knows number two? Who has the second most billionaires? Anyone know? Saudi Arabia. China. People's Republic of China. Communist country has the second most billionaires in the world. The world is safe for billionaires, right? <laughs> and so this capital flows, and ordinary people have to deal with the consequences. So here's uh, the, this in New Zealand. So in the 1980s, prior to the, the wave of neoliberalism, New Zealand was one of the most equal countries in the world. So you know, I study history and identity. This calamity of World War II made the leaders of the world realize making rich people richer and poor people poor is a formula for instability. So they really put in efforts in that post-war golden age, especially in the winners of the, the World War. But hey, Germany hasn't done so bad either, and they lost. So one of the most equal countries, and then of course, this neoliberalism comes in. And the problem is, is that that formula is a little unsustainable for a small country like New Zealand. So it's nearly bankrupt in 84. So it moves into this neoliberal paradigm that I described later. And then this is the Gini coefficient of inequality. Wow. Yeah. So the 80s, when it neoliberalizes all the labor, and the, by the way, and this is the, the little guy being so frustrated, it was a labor government that put in neoliberalism. <laughs> so that betrayal, uh, they're never going to forgive it, the small guy. Okay, but maybe they were forced to because of the near bankruptcy and all these things. Okay, and then from then on, it just goes up. And uh, this uh, Jenny Koshin accelerated by the pandemic. The white collar people like me, we're not affected by the pandemic. We just sit at home in our computers. Do, 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 do. But if you're in the front line, oh, it's a very, very difficult. If you're opening a restaurant, it's very, very difficult. So that's just one country, but I think it will sound familiar to me. <coughs> Right? So this is the formula. New Zealand is just riding on the intellectual wave and the representatives set by those. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, they initiated what's called the Washington Consensus. And this is the basis for neoliberalism. It's fiscal discipline. So this is this invisible hand. It's not invisible at all. It is the central government setting fiscal policy in a particular way. Okay, that prioritizes capital above all else. Tax cuts, especially for the rich, so this is trickle-down theory. So if rich people get rich, you might get a little drop of that uh, benefit. Trade liberalization, and that's why China has benefited so much, is that they have cheap labor. How can you compete with the 1.4 billion Chinese if you're, you know, how many, 6 million Portuguese? You, you cannot. Right, so if I'm, if I'm buying a rosary on the Santiago de Compostela, I'm pretty sure it's made in China or India. <laughs> you know? okay. Deregulation of business, because business is efficient and government is inefficient and stupid. That's the, the ideology. And privatization of public assets. So how do you get rich is you need to be a friend of the central government. They sell you a state asset at a cheap price and then, you know, that, that's the formula. And for a little while it worked. But I think now we're seeing that after 40 years, this model, which is still the dominant model, is really running into some trouble. Okay, so here's the trouble. So these are big numbers. Don't worry about it. It's a real simple curve. 
Here's all the Anglo countries. I put these in, and of course, I'm very sympathetic to Portugal because in New Zealand, we're so small, we're not shown on the graph. But it's the same <laughs> curve, okay? These countries back in the 1920s were hugely unequal. That's why you had the Great Depression and all this kind of crap. And then, of course, after the war, they started realizing, hey, we need to make it more equal so that ordinary people have a stake in our society. So it goes down, and then from 1980, the United States is so unequal, where the amount of wealth of the top 1% is more than 20% in the United States. The other countries are a little lower. Okay, so that's the Anglosphere, and here is Europe. Europe is not so extreme, but you can see that Europe back in 1920 was crazy unequal. So if you think things are bad now, it was a lot worse in 1920. Okay, so then it's more like this. So, so continental Europe especially has never completely neoliberalized, especially if you are France. I mean, here in Portugal, so many strikes, right? The French, uh, they've taken striking to an art. So if you have a very powerful labor sector, you cannot fully neoliberalize. It, it's difficult. They're going to fight you. So those are the two patterns, right? Simple patterns. Of course, Portugal is like New Zealand, too small. They're not. <laughs> okay. um, in this research, we need to be very careful. Because the Americans dominate global literature so much, there's always a temptation to look at America, but if you generalize from America, you're going to be wrong because America is an outlier. Right? America has higher inequality than most countries in the OECD. So if you generalize from them, you're heading down a path that is not such a good path. Okay, and now to look at the range of things. That first simple story presents it as, as this almost like a historical inevitability because the curves are all going in a similar direction. But look at how powerful policy is, okay? So here is the Gini coefficient of a country before transfers. That means before tax, before all these things. Okay, that's uh, there. There's some countries that are quite um, unequal. But now look at the impact of policy. This is the Gini coefficient of inequality after tax and, and transfers. So look at which country is really good. Its initial thing of Iceland is almost 0.4, but after you put in your policy, it's only 0.25. Iceland, we all know, is one of the most democratic countries in the world. They got so angry at their elites you know, for their banking betrayals and all that kind of stuff. So this is a super democratic country that really gets mad when they get betrayed. Whereas in America, if you get betrayed, oh, you just go on, you know, you, you pay all the debts, public pays the debts for all the banks that make mistakes, and then the rich get richer. So there's America. Very poor income transfer policies, okay? Whereas the other ones, Denmark, Belgium, the other ones, all of these countries in Western Europe actually have transfer programs that keep their after tax Gini lower than their before tax Gini, okay? And you can see the countries that really don't work very well, like Mexico, they don't have a very effective taxation policy. Philippines is the same way. If you're rich, you can dodge your taxes in the Philippines. And of course, that's not a formula for success in your country. Yeah, there's um, Turkey. Okay, so th that's a big, so you can see that a lot of this is from political agency. It's not some inevitable factor of, of, of this thing. These are human-made things, but of course they're made by a collectivity, and the collectivity is engineered by both leadership and, of course, representations, right? Okay, this is a super complicated graph. Again, it's a very simple graph. The key problems we're starting to move into now is home ownership. And home ownership has a huge problem with intergenerational inequity. So let me show you. This is a super complicated graph, but I can, again, explain it to you in a very simple way. Here's the age groups. Uh, and here's how, uh, how, what percentage of that age group has home ownership on a particular year. So let's start in this part here. So here's the old folks. Let's just get these, 70s plus, okay? Look at how flat these lines are. 
from 1986 to 2018, their percentage of home ownership is very stable in New Zealand, okay? But now let's go from about here, okay? Look at how much lower the home ownership is among, as time goes on, um, especially among the younger generation. So it just collapse, 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 okay? So it's getting much more difficult for young people in New Zealand to get into the housing market. I think you in Portugal, I see young people here, you know how hard it is. Try to get an apartment in Lisbon or Porto, uh, you better have some parents that are ready to give you some capital, otherwise you have no chance. New Zealand is exactly like that. Okay, so this is just objective data on the realities facing, and of course, this gets, creates instability, right? Because I'm young, I'm gonna get a little bit angry and we had the protests at the moment I stepped foot on Portuguese soil, there was a protest on TV on unaffordable housing. And then uh, there was a strike, so I couldn't get from Lisbon to uh, Braga on the train. So. Okay, this is not unique to New Zealand, so this is the United States, so you can see again, percentage of home ownership. If you are that blessed generation born in the 40s or 60s, no problem. But if you're the, born in the 80s, your percentage of home ownership is much lower. So this is a, a Western-wide problem. So now I want to go specifically to a case study to understand what can you do about it. You know, we want to really talk about agency. But human agency is, in political terms, exercised through political leadership. And of course, this is our superstar, probably our most famous prime minister in history. Uh, she was Jacinda Ardern, and I think she was elected when she was only 36 years old. It was a very surprised election in 2017, but and she has a big smile, she has a social media profile, she's a beautiful communicator, you know, amazing, a very kind persona. And so she was elected in a surprise in 2017. And there was a lot of hope, you know, because she's uh, representing the labor, and it was a surprise defeat for national. So labor center left, national center right. Uh, in, in, in the New Zealand um, context. Uh, in 2021, Fortune magazine rated Jacinda Ardern as the greatest leader in the world, even in love this, this powerful <laughs> old lady. And that was because of her success in managing the coronavirus, right? So we have one of the lowest rates of fatality uh, in, in the world. Um, but not the lowest. There, there are lower rates in other countries. But if you look at world media and the way they represent things, they're always going to pay attention to a white person who's successful more than any other colored person that's successful. So in fact, there are Asian countries with lower uh, death rates than um, New Zealand. But you know this. So she's the most, the greatest leader in the world. But by 2021, everyone around the world loves Jacinda. She can go in the United States and meet the president. And then, by 2021, within New Zealand, she is already not so popular. And I'm going to tell you the reasons why. In 2020, as a consequence of this incredibly good management of the coronavirus, and by the way, their management was incredibly good because we have a very poor health system in New Zealand. Where we, we, I think we only had maybe 20 defibrillizing units in the whole country. So you can imagine if coronavirus got in, the amount of death would be calamitous. We have an underfunded health system, so that quarantine was the only possible solution. And she made the right choice. And the thing is she communicated in a way where the whole country rallied around it. So in 2020, she had a landslide victory. First time under the uh, multi-member proportional system. So we have a proportional system with multiple parties in where Labour won 50% of the popular vote. They could govern alone, but they also brought the Greens in. So it's a center-left coalition. So a landslide, it gives them a mandate. And of course, relevant to this context here, uh, the mandate was used to, one of the 
key platforms of the mandate was affordable housing. Okay? So the promise from our Minister of Housing, Bill Twyford, was a Kiwi bill. To build 100,000 homes by 2030, the announcement was made in 2018. Okay? So 12 years to build 100,000 homes and a $2 billion first budget. It doesn't sound like much, but we're only a country of less than 5 million, so it's a lot. Okay? So we have this Minister of Housing and Urban Development named Phil Twyford, and it followed on from Labor genuinely trying to deal with the problem of unaffordable housing. So his first thing was the Overseas Investment Amendment Act that it bans foreign buyers from buying residential property to ease the country's housing shortage. So before that, anyone could buy New Zealand property, so there's a lot of empty property. I know this is happening in Portugal as well, you know, all the British pounds flowing in and buying things, so that, that was his first uh, move. Um, and, but, you know, it's not so successful because it, it isn't, you know, we love to blame foreigners, but that's usually not the whole story. Okay, so that's his first one. And now the building is trying to pr provide the supply. So um, 100,000 is a lot in the New Zealand context when you have less than five. And so everyone says, well, can you really do this? And this is a real challenge as well on representation because we all have a representation of the left wing being well-meaning, with good ideas, but can they execute? That's a very dominant discourse in New Zealand. I suspect it's in many other countries, right? In Italy, what was they said about Mussolini? At least he made the trains run on time, <laughs> right? Uh, to use an even more extreme example, Hitler turned Germany from hyperinflation and chaos to full employment in three years from 1933 to 1937. Of course, if you're gonna be a crazy dictator and eliminate your enemies, you can be very powerful. But it's, that's the, the, again, this dominant discourse, this traveling memory of representation, and so here's the background. Right? The pandemic provided a critical juncture. You know, on my, I have a book coming out on um, collective remembering and the making of political culture with Cambridge University Press. And one of the chapters deals with the idea of the opportunities provided by history. And the idea is in a critical juncture, there's a crisis, and political agency and political leaders have more power during that moment of time because everyone is afraid. They're looking to the leader to do something. So Ardern had that moment in 2020, okay? Massive landslide victory. And so what can social scientists do we can be scribes and witnesses to these processes. So I worked with uh, Grant Duncan and one of my PhD students to run uh, stuff.co.nz is the biggest co-op newspaper in New Zealand. And so we have these relationships with them. And they ran this uh, survey in the run-up to that 2016 election. Um, oh, sorry, this is not the 20, he, uh, we ran it for the 2020 election, sorry. So we ran it for this landslide election. And we have uh, provided immediate feedback uh, to the populace. So it's a, uh, a procedural justice deliberative democracy. So we're trying to be involved as scribes with the feedback. It's not a representative scientific polling, but you'll be very envious on the N. The N we had for this survey was more than 70,000. Seven and four zeros. Okay, because we're working with other segments of society. And, and I'm just going to prevent one result from this because um, most of it is not about housing. So here's this, this idea of a critical juncture. Here's the empirical evidence. One of our questions was, on rebuilding the economy following the COVID-19 pandemic, which of the following statements best reflects your views? The reason why we have such high responses is we're not using Likert scales. Ordinary people don't like they don't understand it. You know, it's only psychometricians. That's made for psychometricians. This is like uh, Grant calls this, he invented this, he calls it Goldilocks. Right? So there's three choices and you have to choose one of them. So the first one is let's get back to business as usual. Let's do things 31%. And this was the dominant response. And remember, this sample is a self-selected sample. More men than women, more right-wing conservatives than left-wing. Okay? Because the left-wing young people, they don't go on traditional news websites. They only go on social media. 
61%. Let's use this time to reform the economic system. That is an opportunity if I've ever seen one. So here's you know, Jacinda Ardern government with this opportunity. And look at the number of people saying, I'm more concerned about my own financial system, 7.6%. Yeah? This is a moment of possible collective action by leadership. And so what happens? What's this thing? Why is this thing? I can't um, get to close this. Oh, it's not shown. Okay. So, this is the part where essentially we think about social representations theory. So in the standard psychology, the individualistic one, you say, I think, therefore, I am. In social representations, we communicate therein we are created. So there is this background. And the thing that maybe our during and the government weren't aware of is how much neoliberalism had underpinned their thoughts and limited their possibilities before beginning on what had to be a radical rethink for a small country like New Zealand to build 100,000 houses in 12 years is unprecedented. Okay, so we'll see what happens. So what's happening with this in terms of their ability to think outside the box? Or is it constructed by the other people? So Kiwi Build, the target for July 2021 was 16,000 homes. And at that time, the actual build was 1,050. So it was a disaster, pretty much. And of course, uh, now in representations, there's Twyford. So he's aiming at one of them that tent. We knew he was aiming too high, way too high, is 30 degrees, okay? So then you get this type of representation all feeding into what left wing cannot really do anything. And I think this is very familiar to people in Europe as well, right? So the left wing says these things, they're going to do all these things, and then in the end, where, where's the, and then here's the one that says that. So, of course, you fire the housing minister, yeah? because he didn't deliver. This is a policy reset. But of course, what they think is, I think it could do with a dollop of cattle manure, Mr. Twyford. And he said, we started off with that. So it's all just bullshit. So that's what the social representations produce, that this left-wing stuff is just bullshit. And then here's Jacinda, OK? perhaps with some indigenous wellness. So of course the right wing doesn't like that the left wing is always promoting Maori and uh, well-being for Maori and Treaty of Waitangi and all. I can't get into all that, but anyway, it's for minority, less advantaged people, so yeah, a little bit of that. And of course there's the reset time. So now you understand, um, in New Zealand, uh, Ardern is not so popular because this is her signal policy. She had maybe three signal policies. One was Kiwi Bill. One was no child left behind. Because we have a problem with child poverty because Maori reproduce and Pacific reproduce more than the whites. Um, and that was supposed to equalize better opportunities. That one didn't succeed um, either. And so um, her popularity is really declining by 2021. And then the rapid response in 2020 became frustration in 2021 because we were still closed while the rest of the world was open. So by June 2022, this is four years in, they built 1,365 houses. So it's a failure. So what happened? So this is the thing I'm going to really focus in on. Um, but don't worry, this is not going to be the conclusion. Oh, this is just the middle. This is the uh, narrative crisis. But you have to give a happy ending, right? <laughs> Western people demand justification. Uh, Chinese people like sad. We really like sad songs, sad news. <laughs> That's the history. Okay, anyway. So 
the legacy of the 1980s of neoliberalism is the withdrawal of government from providing infrastructure costs necessary for big building projects. So Twyford didn't think through the whole thing. He only thought about making small changes on the side. But if government is not providing transport, sewage, electricity, water, who's going to provide it? Someone has to pay for it. And according to the national government, it should have been local council. You think local council is going to be able to pass bills to put in that kind of money for low-cost housing? It's a big ask. Okay? Kiwi Build was meant to help qualified citizens get into home ownership by subsidizing big private builders to invest. Qualified men having 100000 as a down payment. So if you've already got 100000 you're not the most among the more needy. In New Zealand, they can live in the private housing. They don't need your Kiwi bill. So there's even a problem with low demand. Even the thousand houses didn't have so many people asking for these houses. So because Kiwi bill doesn't pay for infrastructure, it's because it's so expensive. If you're going to build roads, sewage, electricity, it costs a lot of money. Two billion is not enough. And essentially, this is neoliberalism. Successive governments on the left and the right, the center left, center right, tie themselves to total national debt being less than 20% of GDP. And it's because we nearly went bankrupt in 84. And so once you do that, you can't do a big project anymore, unless you do some magical finance. So with this low level of debt, it's impossible for central government to finance infrastructure building. So our Dern was a beautiful communicator, talking really big. But when you get into the nuts and bolts of doing a project, no, just wasn't good. So New Zealand is caught in a trap of slow infrastructure spending. And labor accepted a fundamentally neoliberal premise, a neoliberal representation, even when given a mandate for change. And so then you get people feeling betrayed again. Right? Or you fulfill that representation to the left as good ideas. They talk really big, but they don't deliver. So this is the bittersweet side of the story. It makes me cry as a New Zealander. I always vote for Labour or the Greens, you know. But, uh, so I'm not being um, critical without reason. I'm just describing to you what I see as an insider. Whereas from the outside, you say, oh, she's amazing. She's a great communicator. She is a great communicator. But you've got to deliver on policy. OK, why is it impossible for local council to do this? Because of a thing called NIMBY. NIMBY is not in my backyard. Who votes in a local election? Old, rich suburbanites. Okay? Do they want low, lower cost subsidized housing in their neighborhood? I don't think so. Do they want to pay for more debt that comes from their property taxes? I don't think so. So essentially, local property owners do not want lower cost housing in the neighborhood, and they do not want their local council accumulating more debt to pay for. So Kiwi Bill was dead from the moment they laid the policy down. They just didn't think it through right from those two perspectives. Um, so. And this is a shameful thing for people in my generation because I'm very, very fortunate. Okay, I'm a property owner. I have huge wealth from all of this numbers, right? Because I'm in that 60-some group. So that generation, you know, when we're good, <laughs> peace and love, brother, and then we're old, free travel, free health care, free prescription. And then, of course, there's this intergenerational inequality. And also, again, there's a lack of technical expertise. So the New Zealand building industry is very small. Most building is customized. It's a very small development, not thousands and thousands. The government didn't even carefully plan nor source prefabricated housing. So you have to do all of these details to make something work. You have to understand the representational larger frame and then the details of how you get something to work. And so this is the end of the New Zealand story. So you see? Okay, the problems are a wee bit bigger than I thought. The problem is in the details. You know, the small little things we can't see. Mm -hmm. How are you going to execute that program? So Ardern is going to go down in history as a fantastic crisis manager, but none of her long-term policies were successful. So 
she resigned at the right moment because she was very unpopular and there was a lot of misogyny against her too. So she was a young mother getting death threats from people. It's like, I hear these people must be crazy. And so she resigned at the right moment because her successor, Chris, Chris Hipkins, is um, not such a great communicator, not so charismatic, but he's perceived as more as a solid guy that will do some things. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. The election now is uncertain for October 2023 20, later this year. Okay, um, any questions for the New Zealand case? Because I'm about to move on to uh, another case. I can, can give you a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Yes. yes. Uh, I think I read last, uh, a few weeks ago that there, there is a coming back uh, of uh, support to foreigners to invest again in, uh, in New Zealand. Is that right? I, I don't know. When did this happen? I think I read it in the Guardian or something. That, How long ago? I don't know, a month ago that um, they were complaining about um, nobody uh, of a lack of investment, foreign investment in New Zealand. The, the housing market, that policy of Twyford's for example, has actually been successful. It's cooled down the housing market. So now, of course, the middle class is complaining. So the, the challenge with the housing market in New Zealand is that ordinary upper middle class Kiwis, instead of investing say, in the stock market, they invest in the second house. And the reason is, for your first two houses in New Zealand, if you sell it, you pay no capital gains tax, zero. So that's why an inordinate amount of the money in New Zealand goes into housing, but of course then rents are astronomically expensive, especially in the big cities like Auckland and Wellington. So it's possible, but I haven't really done it been following it uh, so much. Yeah, any other questions about New Zealand or this kind of Western perspective? Okay, so finishing off this lecture. Here's percentage home ownership in some unknown country that has been at 90% since 1995. Um, what country do you think this is? And of course, it's only to 2017. What happened after the pandemic? 88% went down 2%. Think about it. Huh? Singapore. You got it. <laughs> this is Singapore. Okay. So, how can Singapore do this? I don't really know the answer, but uh, I think one of the keys for us as academic is to communicate in these very broad networks. So this is a former PhD student of mine uh, that now works for Kantar. Kantar is a big uh, surveying, global survey research firm. He now works for, for Kantar in Singapore. His name is Chan Hong Leung. Uh, and most of this information I've gotten is, is from him. Because we can't be expert in everything, but we need to be connected to different places where they're doing outstanding work. So, just a little bit of background. Uh, Singapore is an island city-state. Uh, it's predominantly ethnically Chinese, maybe about 70 some percent. And then you have minorities of uh, Tamil Indians uh, and Malays. Uh, three different religions. The Malays are predominantly uh, Islam. The Tamils or the Indians are predominantly Hindu, and the Chinese, well, I don't know what religion they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not so clear. Uh, it's not exactly free market ownership. It's a 99-year lease, but you can sell it for, for profit. But there are costs to selling it for profit. So the first thing you note about this is that there's all sorts of hybridity and mixing going on. So when we use these terms, we imagine there's something solid. But actually, they're very complex, and there are little nuances that make a difference. So 99 year lease. 
And the World Bank called it the best public housing program in the world, any society that can provide 90% home ownership among all the citizens, given how unequal that society was. So uh, in the society, the Chinese are the richer in the city, the Indians are in the middle, and the Malays are at the, the bottom. And of course, this is a little island city-state of five million surrounded by two giant countries. Malaysia, we now know Malaysia is 30 million on one side, and Malaysia is always threatening to cut off Singapore's water and Singapore, you know, they are And then Indonesia, which is even bigger on the other side, is the world's largest Muslim country. And they had race riots in the 60s, okay? So Singapore feels very vulnerable. They really need to dampen down inter-ethnic conflict, because that's a perfect opportunity for one of these other powers to move in. Right. They need to protect the Muslims against the Chinese or something like that. Uh, probably less likely now that China is uh, as strong as it, but you, know, you don't want this to go that way. So, Masagos Zulfiki, the current ministry in charge of Muslim affairs, said people must aspire to own homes because this is an asset that every Singaporean should have. Why are they saying this? It's because of the founder. So of course, in identity and entrepreneurship, the founding figure always sets important things for what the society is going to be. There are identity entrepreneurs. They decide who's in the in-group, who's in the out-group, and what is the content of group norms. And of course, this is Lee Kuan Yew. So he would be one of the great post-war leaders uh, in the 20th century, because Singapore had nothing at the moment of the end of World War II. Yeah, it was conquered by Japan, British went home with their tails between their legs, and they're briefly part of a Malay union, and then the Malaysians kicked them out because I think Lee Kuan Yew might have won a national election, and the Malaysians said, no, that Chinaman is not going to be the president of Malaysia, so they were kicked out. So they were in desperation, and so Lee had this sense of threat, and what he said was, my primary preoccupation was to give every citizen a stake in the country and its future. I wanted a home on the society. Yeah? So you can't have Singaporeans who are ethnically Malay or Muslim saying, oh, actually, I'd rather have be part of Malaysia if you're going to get into a fight. Right? So fundamentally, Housing in Singapore is positioned as part of nation building. So it's, it's a fundamental part of the founding representation of Singapore. And it also, coincidentally, takes care of retirement. Um, so it's embedded. There's no neoliberalism in this model. It's a nationalistic model, not a neoliberal model. <clears throat> So what's the secret point? How can you afford this? This is the immediate thing that I think, because I'm indoctrinated into neoliberalism just like everyone else, right? We're trained to think it's fiscally irresponsible. You can't do it. Well, they did it. How did they do it? First, um, you have mandatory retirement savings. And they've been doing this since the 60s. You allow retirement savings to pay for housing purchase. But that's risky, isn't it? Of course it's risky. But as Chan Hoon said to me, I said, oh, um, uh, Chan Hoon, um, do you work for the government now? And he said, you know, Jim, in Singapore, one way or the other, everyone works for the government. Okay? It's a city state. It's a small area. The government is very powerful and quite efficient. So the government is able to inflate. Uh, HDB is this public housing. Okay, So the government built housing flat prices. So you can see that, that they index these things, and they index it in a way that you're, you're a flat, you're publicly owned flat, that you put your retirement savings and increases in time. It's a very good investment, but it is completely against neoliberal market principles. It's privatized, but not privatized. It's a 99-year lease. It's a free market, but only to an extent. It's all managed in a way where the priority is there are no Malay, Tamil, or Chinese exclusive communities. 
So if the percentage of any of those groups falls below a certain level in your neighborhood, you can't sell to anyone but that group. Okay, because they want a fully integrated society. They don't want the Malays to live in the slum and the Chinese to live in the thing. And um, I'll go back a little bit. It, it's not 100%. So this is uh, the blue bars are total ownership and the black line is public HDB housing. So you can see there are a very wealthy 8% that are in private housing. But that's a very small thing. And so the rental market is very small because the government is managing most things. Okay. And of course, the other thing you do is there's this intergenerational um, inequity. You subsidize new filings. Right? So young people, you give them a chance. So some of these are, are very doable in other societies. Australia subsidizes um, first time homeowners. So again, it's giving every citizen a stake in the national collective. And neoliberalism does not do that. Okay, so this is the question I'm trying to come to. The bigger theory uh, side of things, Singapore has a big brother state. It is big brother in a way that Westerners may find a little bit frightening, okay? Because the government owns most of the land. The government mandates the composition of, of ethnicity within neighborhoods. And then they have little helpful things as well. This is very Confucian, this benevolent model. You teach people what they ought to do. They have a home ownership support team in the HDB, these public flats, which advises rental tenants on their options for purchasing a home. So they put uh, expertise and social normative pressure on people to get into this model. And so you notice that was the person I quoted was a minister for Muslim affairs because again, the lowest percentage of home ownership is among the Malays and Muslims. So they're consciously socially engineering society to try to manage the inequity. So, um, you know, um, earlier Claudia talked about this in an abstract this is, they're really doing it, not on gender issues, but on ethnicity issues. They've decided to build their state on these premises. Yeah. And last of all, they prevent speculation. There is some property speculation, but it's not heated. In New Zealand, it's heated. I suspect Portugal, it's heated property speculation. It's, there's all sorts of rules to penalize people from trying, and they still make money. So, so it's, everything is like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know, not totalitarian, but not free, somewhere in the middle. And that's the representation I think actually works. If you believe in any theoretical model that comes out of Washington, you're going to fail. If that's what happened in New Zealand. You know, it's just this, oh, we, we can do this. But if you understand your own historical trajectory, and you can say, what elements of this might work in my country. So, um, conclusion, Singapore housing success? Yes, fully on time. Um, it's almost a complete reversal of neoliberalism and free market capitalism. And I was uh, saying to Gabriel um, when we were talking about dinner, I wish there was more attention in Western media to Switzerland because Swiss democracy is a local neighborhood and canton-based democracy that forces people to talk through their differences as opposed to say, oh, I exclude you, you're out here. And they're heterogeneous, but they form a federation. No one talks about this as a viable mode of democracy, and it's needed in so many countries. We have this tribe and that tribe. And and here's again the Singapore model. I mean, how many of you had heard about the Singapore model of housing before? Yeah, one person. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So if you trust your dominant mass media, you are not going to know about best practices around the world because there's a habitual looking to the UK and the US. And as an American, and I'm an American citizen, uh, the US is in decline. And I'm not saying this in a bad way, I'm just saying because 
I communicate with a lot of Americans. My best friends are in America. That's what they say. This is not the country that's going to provide you with the solution, and yet there's no mass media that you're telling you about these alternatives that are possible. Because who owns the mass media? Rupert Murdoch. Right? They're not going to tell you these kinds of things. So you have to find these things out. I'm going to give you some caveats as well, because it's not things. Two of the elements in Singapore are difficult or impossible to replicate elsewhere. One is control of the resale market. That's really hard to do. You can only do it because Singapore is this tiny little thing and they have it, and ownership of land. But you can't do it. The government just doesn't own the land. The government has to buy the land. You can't just take it away. They've been doing this. So those things cannot be transported. But the other four elements may be transportable. So, uh, so um, there could be a home ownership support team. They're giving you knowledge and advice. There could be rules to make speculation more difficult. We have that in New Zealand now. So you can't easily flip property. If you sell property within, I think, three years of purchase, you have to pay an extra. You do have to pay property, capital gains tax. After three years, you don't have to pay tax. So you can do that. And allowing retirement savings to pay for housing purchase, you can certainly do that, but you probably need very good advice when you do it, because that's a risk for you um, later on, and you can certainly subsidize new, new owners. So some of the things are doable, uh, and the others uh, uh, are not. And now I want to close. Um, the Singapore model is very familiar to me because I'm ethnically Chinese, and Chinese have this model. It's a top-down system. It's hierarchical relationalism. So Lee Kuan Yew is a benevolent leader, uh, and everyone should follow and respect the leader. So the amount of respect given to a leader in Singapore is still quite a bit higher than the respect given to a leader in Western society. I mean, I, I think it's just, who would want to be a prime minister in New Zealand? I mean, Jacinda Ardern, to me, whatever she, her strengths or weaknesses, she was an amazing person to receive death threats and people, you know, walking up to her, and uh, that's horrible. So there's that, that, that the thing, this idea of this ordered command structure. There's a deep underlying structure there that enables a particular historical trajectory. So people in Singapore accepted this big, giant government. Of course, those who didn't accept it didn't have such good outcomes either. I knew someone who was in the opposition party in Singapore is no fun being opposition in Singapore. They have this kind of funky model where if the PAP, that's the ruling party that had been only one ruling party for the whole history of Singapore, if they drop below 60%, they change and pivot their policy. If their, their support level is at 80%, okay, everything's fine. So it's a different kind of democracy that's in this kind of benevolent authority model. And of course, China has been studying this model, but they were not able to implement it because China's a big, giant country and Singapore's, you know, one middle sized um, city. China. And then you have this ideal that people subscribe to here in, in Western Europe of this liberal democracy, this freedom, equality, and either property or community rights. So um, um, this, this free flow of communication that should allow for innovation and activation of social capital. But the problem is, is that this model being undermined by capitalism and neoliberalism. So there's this idea of freedom, but there is this invisible hand underneath that is not so free. So to me, the su most successful countries dealing with housing have a very strong intervention from the state. And the state has to be confident. The state, because you're putting so much of the national into this, Singapore has done well. I'm sure there's countries that try to have a strong state that don't do so well either. So you have to study it really carefully in order to make this work. But you also shouldn't have a knee-jerk reaction that this hierarchical, hierarchical relationship, relationalism is always wrong. 
And the correct model is always the Western model. Yeah, that, that we, you've seen the numbers. You've seen the data here. So I'll kind of close this by talking about how we manage this because um, I use the example of Singapore because Singapore is not so threatening. It's only five million people. It's a small uh, country in the South Pacific. But the model they're following is very similar to the China model. But the China model doesn't have the bells and whistles, right? But at the end of the day, Singapore has been ruled by one party for more than half a century. And clearly, the uh, Pe People's Republic of China, the Communist Party, isn't stepping down anytime soon. But is it an evil regime the way the US wants to present it? I don't think so either. So they've managed pretty well for their citizens for the most part using state-based capitalism. So the, the, the dirty story of neoliberalism is that state-based capitalism has always been as good or better an option as neoliberal capitalism. Um, Germany's rise was state-based capitalism. Um, Otto von Bismarck produced the world's first social security system. Why he wanted healthy workers. Not for any romantic reason, <laughs> but he wants a strong body. Yeah? And of course, it's very sexist because it was the man, so you had to get married to get that social uh, security. Okay. So to me, there's this yin and the yang. Everything is coming together, these different mixes, these models. I thank you for inviting me to share this kind of ethnically Chinese model. I hope I've convinced you that it's not something to just fear automatically. Because um, at the end of the day, there's no one civilization or one culture that has all the solutions for everything. And it's this mixing and matching and choosing a policy that's in accord with your historical trajectory, in accord with the representations that you can move people on, as opposed to just importing something from the outside. That almost um, never works. And then on the other side is probably communications. How do we communicate so that different people who are now rubbing shoulders against one another can coexist side by side. So I'll, I'll close with just a little bit of a performance. This is the, the last little bit. Um, I, I thank um, you all for inviting me because it gave me the chance to go with my wife on the Santiago de Compostela. So this garment is, is exactly like this. Does anyone know what this garment is? What ethnicity group does it come from? It's a barong, and it comes from Filipino culture, but you see it's Chinese button elements. This is made of pineapple um, fiber because the Philippines is very hot and uh, you need uh, cool weather. And of course, um, it's one of the few things where we men are allowed to not be in black. But um, inside this, um, probably something a little bit more familiar. What I did in coming here was I walked with my Catholic wife to the Santiago de Compostela. So I love, you know, I'm uh, Tiago, uh, not San, no San, but uh, Tiago. And what I love about St. James Cross is that it's a sword with a cross. And you need to think about this as you carry your message forward is that you have your dreams and you need to take your spiritual power into executing what you are capable of with your dreams and never just look at the outside, also look at the inside because deeper inside, we're all human and we might conceal things that you don't know that I'm actually a Catholic. <laughs> Thank you very much.